if somebody was going to convince me of the need for, for a God, it, it would be there. If you're not impressed with the fine tuning argument for the existence of God, watch this video because in this video, we're going to be breaking down three different clips and they're all relating to what they call the best argument for the existence of God. Do I have that right? That's exactly right. All right, let's get into it. At some point, certainly, we all asked, well, which is the best argument you've yet come up against from the other side? And I think every one of us picks the fine-tuning one. It's the, the, the most intriguing. The golden locks. Yeah. yeah, okay. Fine, the fine-tuning, the one degree, well, one degree, one hair different to nothing. But even though it doesn't prove design, doesn't prove a designer, could all have happened without... It, it, you have to spend time thinking about it working on it. It's not a trivial. We all say that. And then at one point, I think this is not on camera, um, I said, if um, if I could convert everyone in the world, not convert, if I could convince to be a non-believer, and I, I'd really done brilliantly, and there was only one left, one more, and then it'd be done. And there'd be no more religion in the world. No more deers, deers. I wouldn't do it. And Dawkins said, what do you mean you wouldn't do it? I said, I don't quite know why I wouldn't do it. And it's not just because there would be nothing left to argue with and no one left to argue with. It's not just that. Though there would be that. Somehow, I, if I could drive it out of the world, I wouldn't. And the incredulity with which he looked at me, stays with me still. He's willing in that moment to sort of say, like, I don't know if I really want to just completely eliminate it, completely get rid of it. Um, and I, I think we're seeing even more of that now as a lot of top atheists are saying that they're cultural Christians or that they're uh, recognizing that essentially just the, the foundations of society can't survive without God. It's interesting. Okay, so here's clip two. Uh, Christopher Hitchens impressed with the fine-tuning art. Okay, so let's check it out. Why are conditions so optimal for life? in this terrestrial orb. Fine-tuning. Fine-tuning. And I was surprised to find that Richard was impressed by that too. I mean, we know what the arguments against it are, and I can tell them to you if you like, and I consider them to be pretty conclusive arguments, but there is something that has to impress you. I mean, the, the likelihood that there could be nothing is so strong, and there's actually the certainty that there will one day be nothing, which someone must also have designed, and that there was before that nothing, which was Who's the, is, is that supposed to be designed as well? I don't know. But not to be impressed by the fact that we are here rather than not it, is to be, well, um, too easily unimpressed. Impressed is a good word, too, because I feel like that's, that's sort of a feeling that I get when I listen to people talking about the actual fine-tuning and the, the statistics around it, because when you when you start to grasp just how unlikely it is that these things got right randomly i, I let's let's hear Dawkins out first because yeah. i i, I want to unpack basically what are the different reigning theories and options that try to explain this in opposition to the idea that we exist because we're wanted like the universe is in fact designed for life with intentionality, but like, how? What are the ways of getting around that? I want to get into it, but let, let, let's let's play out Dawkins here first. Our third and final clip on the same topic of the fine tuning. Right, but you said that uh, well, it's happened just because of the laws of physics. I want to take this back to that step. Where did those come from? Well, let's get to that then, because because you keep getting to that, and, and that I believe that's a <laughs> that's a very profound. Um, I mean, if. If somebody was going to convince me of the need for for a god, it it would be there. It, it would be not in my own field of of biology. When 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 you come on later to the um, origin of the physical constants, now that's getting getting warm. That getting close to a good argument, um, um, unlike the unlike the morality one. Um, <laughs> well, is that is that mainly because it is a essentially a scientific well, argument? No, no, no. It's, that's it's obviously much, it's the, the area you're happiest it's, with. It's, it's that the the physical constants, um, things like the speed of light, gravitational constant, um, and strong and weak force and things, um, physicists agree, most physicists agree, 
that if you if you change any of those constants by even a very very small amount, then we we we, we don't come into existence. The universe doesn't come into existence. Mm. They have to be like that in order for galaxies to form, for stars to form, for chemistry to form, actually, um, mm. and and then for, uh, for for the prerequisite for life to evolve uh, needs that as well. So. That's the nearest approach to a good argument. By the way, I want to be very careful about this because I once said that, um, and and the I, I'm not going to mention the name of the man I was having having a debate with. Um, he he seized on to that later, and then I think a couple of days later he went up to Scotland and said, "Dawkins is a convert. Um, he's he's, 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 he's <laughs> or, or not 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 quite that." I, th I think what you, what a you gave an inch and he took a mile. I exactly. Yes. Um, I, I, uh, yeah. Well, well, look, I, 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 I'm very familiar with this argument as well. Often called the the argument for God from fine tuning. It's it's it is essentially a design argument. It's saying you know yes, yeah. look at the extraordinary fine tuning of these uh, initial constants of the universe. If they differed from their actual value just a tiny bit we wouldn't have a universe capable of producing life and yet here we are it needs an explanation one of the explanations on the table is a designer behind behind the whole thing um and and when you look at the you know the, the extraordinary numbers we're talking about you can see why it does you know even for someone like you richard you know you'd say that if there were an argument it might be this one and actually i've heard many other atheists say that um peter milliker i think hitchens um you know all said okay that might be the one if if you were gonna you know crack the door open a little bit um so but i think i think what you were coming to richard is is why you still think this is um you know you're still essentially pointing to a, a gap and, and filling well, it with yes, God? Is that your I mean, problem it, it, because with, with this? Because it seems to me all you're doing is pushing it back a stage and you've still got, got to explain God. Right. You're, you're, you're saying um, we need an explanation for the fine-tuning. And so we postulate a fine-tuner. Um, but you haven't mm -hmm. explained anything. I mean, you've, you've simply invented. Okay. You've magicked away the problem. And, and this is... This this has been one of your your, your key arguments in, in your books, Richard, you know, just positing God just leaves you with something more complex to, to, to describe something. Well, really there, there, there's that. Um, what, what's, but but, but yes. I think but, but also but, yes. um, you, you might convince somebody like me to be a deist. But then you suddenly say, OK, well, because of ah, he's converted. Did you hear that yeah, right yeah. here? <laughs> <laughs> because... To say that, oh, there's a designer for this is not pushing back the problem one one step. It's it's actually saying, you know what? This seems to be a reasonable explanation for this, just like uh, computer programs have a programmer, just like car manufacturers have, you know, Elon Musk. Uh, you've got to have a designer. You've got to have something that's come up with this, that's done this intentionally. And so, um, yeah, I just think the fine tuning and, and you brought up the multiverse earlier, which mm -hmm. I think a lot yeah. of people like to sort of go, you know, well, what if there's just, uh, you know, uh, a huge number of universes out there and we just happen to be the one that got it right. I think a lot of philosophers have sort of pointed out that this is not this actually doesn't solve the problem because uh, so Philip Goff, for example, he's a, a philosopher. He gives what he calls the inverse gambler's fallacy. Mm -hmm. So the gambler's fallacy says, you know, oh, I've been I've been gambling all night. Surely my luck's about to come. You know, I've I, I've been gambling. You know, my luck's about to to go in my favor. Well, that's a fallacy because every hand of poker or what, whatever the the game is, every single hand you're unlikely to win mm. every single time. Um, and poker is not a good example because that's skill based. Let's just go for you know uh, r you know roulette or something like that. Every time you you roll the ball, it is unlikely that you're going to win. It's not as though as the the times go on, there. Their, your your odds are going up. So the inverse gambler's fallacy is is you know you walk into a casino and you see somebody winning at Russian roulette and you go wow they must have been here all night they must have been trying time and time again, and it's like no that's that doesn't make any sense. the 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 only way that it would make sense is if it's more like a lottery where yes the odds are unlikely that you're going to win, but every single permutation of this thing is going to be tried that you know one two three four all the way up to a, a million or something like that. Every single permutation is going to be tried. But if there's a multiverse, why would we believe that it's 
we're trying every single possibility. Why are we, why are we believing that, you know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, almost like Spider-Man, you know, where they're trying to figure out the, the Spider-Man gene and he's, they're running through the gene codes and then it's like, oh, this is the combination that works. Well, in order to have that, you need some sort of finely tuned process that's trying out all the possibilities. Right. And with a multiverse, why do you, you know, if, if that's the case, well, then you need a fine tuner for that process. You need something that is yeah. creating this process. And that's what would actually pull, push it back one more step. Absolutely. And, and not only that, but where is the actual observable scientific evidence for the multiverse? Number yeah. one. Yeah, there's none. And then yeah. where is the, where is either the logic or the evidence for the idea that the multiple universes would be causally related to each other? Kind yeah. of to your point where help me help it make sense to me that that this other universe somehow has a causal bearing on our universe how do they interact with each other it just doesn't even make sense at all and if, and so if there isn't a causal relationship from universe to universe to universe mm. then i think kind of to the point that you're making then each and every of these multiple or even in some instances people talk about infinite number of universes yeah. would each require their own fine tuning yeah. so you've actually multiplied the problem of fine tuning times a mi times infinity literally yeah. if if you're saying that there's an infinite number of universes if they're not causally related and then if they are causally related then then help me understand how but the point is in, in any instance you're not you're not doing science yeah you're not observing something to make this you're just coming up with a wild science fiction <laughs> science fiction theory that could possibly but oops not actually quite really explain the fine tuning argument yeah, at least that's how I see it. And I, I just I like to these clips how they they also dismantle. I think sometimes I hear uh, people give sort of just dismissal responses, and they're like, "Oh, well, life would just be different than what you know it is now." And even what Dawkins said in that clip, he's like, "No, life could not exist anywhere in the universe if these." He said half a dozen. I think it's probably a lot more than that. But these constants, yeah, if they were different than what they are. Um, it's not, we're not talking about what life would look like or, you know, whether life would be slightly different if these things were different. No, we're talking about no more, no more forming of planets anymore, <laughs> you know, nowhere for us to literally exist yeah. um, and life just not being possible. So I, I would just encourage somebody who is skeptical towards the fine tuning. Have you really like dug into the, to the de depths of it? Have you actually understood the, the real strength of the argument? If not, I would encourage you to to read it straight from the source. Go to go to you know uh, Luke Barnes has a book called uh, A Fortunate Universe that he co-wrote with an atheist, uh, and he's a he's a cosmologist. He's literally studying the the physical constants. He's running simulations. He's looking at the the fine tuning of the universe. Or read you know Stephen Meyer's uh, Return of the God Hypothesis, mm -hmm. or the, these people who really are diving in deep on, on these things and make sure you're you're actually rejecting the real argument and not just uh you know. A lesser version of it and really the whole t idea of God of the gaps just doesn't make any sense uh, because the whole premise of it is that there are these gaps in our knowledge that science shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until we can explain everything and there's no there's no need for right. you know God to be in that gap anymore and what we find with the fine-tuning of the universe is is exactly the opposite those gaps are sh are are getting bigger and bigger and bigger the more we discover about the universe the more we realize how improbable life is those things have not gotten smaller. They've gotten bigger, and they've gotten so big that they they can't be filled with some sort of naturalistic process. Right. So, right. And and yeah. I love the way you're saying that because if you start with the wrong uh, premise, yeah, and you say, you know, um, I mean, I, I think I'm a little bit borrowing this from Frank Turek, but you know, um, uh, there there's. There's no uh, mom in the equation, and the kid comes home from school, and he sees the the you know the letters spilled out, and it's and it spells out, "Mom is away at the grocery store. I'll be home in 15 minutes. Love you, mom." But if you start with "There's no mom," there is no mom. <laughs> yeah. Then, but you're looking at that, and you go, "Okay, we know there's no mom," and I'm really really tempted to say that <laughs> yeah. mom is responsible for this because yeah. it looks extremely finely tuned and intentional. Yeah. But we know there's no mom, so therefore it's chance. Therefore. Yeah. You know, there was an earthquake and the box of cereal fell and all the letters assembled to yeah. create that message. And if I were to suggest mom, it would be mom of the gaps because <laughs> I start with saying there's definitely yeah. no mom. Yeah, yeah. This is the same level of, of reasoning that I think we're yeah. facing. And with all due love, uh, love and respect, if you, yeah. if you are an atheist, uh, I'm happy that you're listening to this conversation. But I do think that there's a basic logical problem being made there when you begin with the end in mind. Yep, agreed. Anything else to say on fine tuning? That's it. I love it. Fine tuning's great. All right, <laughs> next video. Imagine you fill the entire observable universe 
that's r roughly 93 billion light years across with grains of sand. You label one specific grain of sand somewhere in this cosmic sandbox, one grain of sand. Now you're blindfolded and now you're given a spaceship and you're asked to randomly pick out the one grain of sand from the entire sandbox of the observable universe. The chance of picking that one labeled grain of sand on your first try is one in 10 to the 120th. That's the probability of the cosmological constant. If it's not designed, if it's oh. not intended, if it's not on purpose, if it's actually just chance, then let's be really clear here. If you're basically a materialist and an atheist, you're saying that that is what <laughs> happened. And, and, and to me, I don't have that much faith.